Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Nilfar Farkazi, and I am the Director of Education and Community Outreach here at the Center for Innovative GI and Care. So today we're going to dive into some pervasive myths about fibroids, their characteristics, symptoms, and treatments. And as February marks Black History Month, it's so important to highlight that African-American women are disproportionately affected by fibroids. African-American women are more likely to have more fibroids and they're often diagnosed, well, they are diagnosed at a younger age and they're more likely to experience more severe symptoms compared to women of all other races. And just to give you an idea of how common fibroids are, 80% of all women by the age of 50 are affected by fibroids. And for African-American women, that number can be closer to 90%. So this is a widespread and very common condition, and it's so important to be well-informed about it. And joining me today is Dr. Natalia Danilians. Dr. D is a board-certified, fellowship-trained, minimally invasive GYN surgeon and co-founder of the Center for Innovative GYN Care here in Rockville, Maryland. Dr. D completed her residency at George Washington University, where she served as chief resident and received fellowship training in advanced retroperitoneal laparoscopic surgery through the exclusive Johnson & Johnson Ethicon Endosurgery Program. Thanks for joining us, Dr. D. Thank you for having me. Um, so, Dr. D, there's so much anecdotal information on the internet that we can't possibly filter out what is misinformation unless we're an expert on the subject. And it's a common thing to turn to Dr. Google when we have symptoms for a certain condition so we can either self-diagnose ourselves or create our own treatment plan. For this reason, we want to provide our viewers clarity on fibroid-related fibroid related claims to ensure everyone has accurate information they need to make the best treatment decisions for their health. And what better way to do that than to seek answers from a fibroid specialist like yourself. Um, so first we'll go into the characteristics and symptoms of fibroids, and then we'll jump into talking about how fibroids affect fertility, and then we'll close off with treatments of fibroids. And our goal today is to cover all of these topics, but we'll see how far we get. Before I dive into the first myth, first myth I just want to ask our viewers to leave a comment below with what you've heard about fibroids and we'll make sure to address your comments later on in the live. So let's get started, Dr. D. Our very first myth is fibroids only impact women in their 30s or 40s and they will disappear after menopause. Yeah, so that's a, a common misconception. So of course you can have fibroids earlier um, right. As you mentioned, um, African-American women often have fibroids um, that are in, in their 20s. So it's important to diagnose it at, at the time when you know symptoms appear or it perhaps even screen uh, patients who are at high risk, i.e. African-American women. So there's no harm in getting an ultrasound, mm -hmm. for example, right, to diagnose um, or to rule out fibroids. Um, and then fibroids do not disappear with menopause. So a lot of women that have known fibroids and have symptoms delay um, or, or even um, cancel surgery or, or don't schedule surgery, let's say, because they hope that their symptoms will just go away as they hit menopause. So fibroids don't go away with menopause. Yes, they do. New fibroids wouldn't, should not grow after menopause, right? Because fibroids are hormone dependent and after menopause, the hormone production declines. Um, so new fibroids won't grow and the existing fibroids typically don't increase in size, um, but certainly the ones that are there will remain there. So if there's fibroids that are causing abnormal bleeding, um, you could experience that even after menopause. So which is we call postmenopausal bleeding. Um, if fibroids are causing pressure, um, frequent urination, lower back pain, if the fibroids are so large that they're actually protruding um, and causing, you know, enlarged abdomen, those things are unlikely to go away uh, with menopause because at this point the fibers are so large that they're not going to, you know, shrink um, and go away. Got it. 
Okay, so let's move on to our next myth. All people with fibroids have debilitating symptoms like heavy bleeding and severe pelvic pain. Um, so that's also incorrect. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of women who do not experience those symptoms say, you know, I really don't have any symptoms. So therefore, why, why really do I need treatment? Fibroids. Mm -hmm. The problem is that fibroids are, you know, so they're non-cancerous tumors. Um, and then as I mentioned, they get larger with time. Um, all they need is blood supply and um, estrogen. Um, and in premenopausal women, you know, both those things are present. So as long as they have blood flow going to them, which is coming from the uterus, um, and as long as there's estrogen production, they're just going to continue to get larger and larger. So depending on the location of the fibroids, symptoms can be different. You know, some patients may have abnormal bleeding, even with small fibroids, because those are deeper in, in the uterine lining. Um, versus somebody with very large fibroids on the outside of the uterus may not have abnormal bleeding at all. And it's those patients who end up actually delaying, you know, surgery because it doesn't seem necessary. Um, and as the fibroids get large, you know, you can have this very big abdomen, um, you know, patient or other people may think that you're pregnant because your belly is so large um, and they don't know you have fibroids and those are fibroids. So, Yes, you may feel that you do not have symptoms, but honestly, having a large belly and people confusing you for being pregnant, you know, it, it's it's sort of a problem, right? It, it's a mm -hmm. symptom in, in itself. Um, so that still needs to be addressed because the larger the fibroids, the larger the uterus, um, the surgery is going to be complicated. Um, it doesn't matter if you're preserving the uterus for fertility or if you're, you know, done with childbearing. Um, it's still not going to be a simple procedure. Um, it's going to be much more complicated with higher risks the, the further you delay surgery. Um, so, you know, lack of symptoms doesn't mean that the issue doesn't need to be addressed. Absolutely. And also, if you are a patient that is not experiencing symptoms, but and you go all these years without experiencing those symptoms, you don't even know you have fibroids until you start to try to conceive. And that's the point when you can't, you can't become pregnant and you go get checked down, then you realize you have fibroids. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the different types of fibroids? Sure. Um, so fibroids, like I said, they're benign tumors of the uterus. Um, so they're typically, although in some cases they can grow outside of the uterus, but typically they're growing from the uterus, from some part of the uterus. So, so the inside and the uterine, uh, we call them intracavitary or, or submucosal fibroids. So those are the type of fibroids that typically cause some kind of abnormal bleeding. It could be, you know, prolonged periods. It could be spotting in between periods, um, heavy bleeding you know, unpredictable bleeding. So any type of kind of irregular bleeding, um, these fibers typically cause. And then they also impact fertility, right? Because they're taking up space where implantation would, would take place. So this is inside the uterine cavity. Um, then as we're moving out, we're getting into the uterine muscle. Um, and so those are uh, intramural fibroids. Um, so those are in the uterine muscle. And then as we're moving out further towards the out, outside of the uterus, you have the subserosal that are kind of more towards the surface of the uterus. And then the pedunculated fibroids are the ones that are on the outside of the uterus and they're attached by stalk um, to the uterus. Um, and you can have a fibroid that, that's so large that it spans sort of several areas of the uterus, right? It could be in the muscle, but because muscle is only, you know, this thick, um, and if it's a fibroid this big, part of it is going to be in the muscle, part of it could be protruding into the uterine cavity, and then part of it is going to be protruding to the outside, right? So it's not strictly um, just limited to one area. Uh, Got but, it. but, you know, location typically is going to dictate the symptoms. Okay. And we have an audience comment actually from Roops. She's asking, well, a question. Um, is it better to get an ultrasound or a MRI to diagnose a fibroid and to determine the size of the fibroid? Yeah, um, you can start with an ultrasound. Um, certainly it's a you know, lower cost um, and easier test to get. 
Uh, many of the uh, GYN offices have ultrasounds in their office. So um, it's a sort of a quick way to rule out or rule in the fibroid. And then if there's uncertainty, um, then an MRI could be done um, to kind of further characterize the fibroids. Um, sometimes there's a condition called adenomyosis, which is endometriosis of the uterine muscle, and they can appear like a fibroid on an ultrasound. Um, mm -hmm. So in those cases, if, if adenomyosis is suspected, um, then a lot of times I will get an MRI to see if there's also adenomyosis present because it's going to change um, management. But the, definitely at first you start out with, a, with an ultrasound. Okay, great, thank you. So let's jump to our next myth. Um, fibroids are cancerous or increase women's risk of cancer. Yeah, so fibroids are non-cancerous um, tumors of the uterus. Um, however, um, just because you know you have fibroids doesn't mean that something else isn't going on in the uterus. So it, it's not uncommon that let's say someone has known history of fibroids and has abnormal bleeding, um, and as as this bleeding continues year after year, you just sort of assume that it's still the fibroids causing the bleeding. Um, well, there could be you know uterine cancer, early uterine cancer happening. Um, that wasn't there before, that's now uh, the main factor in the bleeding. So it's, it's always important to rule out, um, for example, uh, uh, cancer of the uterine lining, which is very common, and that usually presents as abnormal bleeding. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, you know, when we, when we see someone who's coming in, let's say they're thinking about having surgery, whether it's fibroid removal or whether it's, it's a hysterectomy for fibroids, we always want to rule out uterine cancer because it's um, it, again, it's going to change, you know, management and treatment and everything. But fibroids themselves are, are not cancerous. Okay. And I encourage everyone to actually view our, we did an entire Facebook Live on uh, GYN cancers. Um, that's on our website, so in our Facebook page. So I encourage you all to view that as well for more information. So let's jump into our next myth. Um, and this is about the this watch and wait approach we hear a lot when it comes to fibroids. Um, and the myth is that it's okay to watch fibroids and wait to see if they need treatment. Right. So, you know, typically when we diagnose fibroids, um, you know, the reason someone gets an ultrasound is because they're having an issue. So that's, you know, number one problem with watching and waiting. If, if there's already a, a symptom, like let's say heavy bleeding or pain, you know, watching and waiting doesn't make sense from even just that, that standpoint. Um, mm. And then, you know, if the fibroids continue to your symptoms, you presume would get worse. Um, and then we have to worry about uh, impact on fertility if, if that's if that's an issue. So, um, you know, those are the reasons you really don't, you want to address these fibroids earlier rather than later. And also, as I mentioned earlier, as the fibroids get larger, um, and more multiple, uh, the surgery can be much more complicated. So even in the experienced hands, um, you know, there, there are higher risks. Um, there's, you know, when it comes to fertility, it's much more difficult to preserve fertility uh, when the uterus has been completely replaced by fibroids. Um, and that's very different from preserving the uterus. And I always, you know, try to explain that to the patients. Um, you know, yes, we can preserve your uterus, uh, but is, it, is this going to be a fertile uterus? Can we preserve fertility in this situation? And, and sometimes it's just not possible because the uterus has been so damaged by these fibroids because of this watching and waiting. That's a really good point. We can preserve your uterus, but will it be a fertile uterus? That's right. a really good point. Um, we So before we move on to, um, I'd like to share some stats from our Women's Health Survey, but I wanted to ask our viewers, has a physician ever told you to watch and wait or otherwise not to worry about treatment for fibroids for the time being? And if so, what was the reason they gave you? Um, and I just wanted to share. So we did a women's health survey last year and um, we found that of those women diagnosed with fibroids, and those that were directed by their physicians to watch and wait, close to 80% said that their symptoms got worse. And then of these respondents, 90% who later had surgery ended up saying that 
their fibroids increased in size during that watch and wait period. And so we can clearly see here from our survey results that this delay in care leads to the worsening of symptoms and just the progression of the condition overall, the, the increase in size of the fibroids. And we understand that COVID-19 has presented a major challenge in seeking GYN care, which is why many women have delayed their care for their fibroid diagnosis or treatment. Um, although we are still very much in the middle of a pandemic, that pain and the progression of fibroids are not put on pause. And this doesn't have to be the case because having surgery at our ASC or just an ambulatory surgery center, which is separate from a hospital, is a safer option because you there's a lower risk of exposure to COVID-19. And also having surgery at an ASC allows patients to bypass that backlog of surgeries that are piling up at hospitals. So if you're having surgery at a hospital, most likely you're on a three to six month waiting list because your surgery for fibroids would be considered elective at a hospital. And if you're in pain, nothing should be considered elective. And that's not the case at, at our practice. Um, so uh, we have a audience comment from Roops. Um, and she said, oh, this is from our previous um, uh, audience question. So yes, I was told it's not harmful just to wait and see what happens. By that time, it increased in size. Women need to go to a specialist first and not wait. Absolutely, Roops. Um, and then an from Anita Thomas. Yeah, she said, Anita said, perimenopause was the reason provided. There's an earlier question. So does, say, does it make sense to do a hysterectomy for a 10 centimeter fibroid for perimenopausal woman? Um, I mean, 10 centimeters is, is pretty sizable. You know, it's like, like this. Hmm. So, um, I mean, it, it depends, you know, where it is, I would say, and, and how perimenopausal are you? Um, I mean, if you have, you know, zero symptoms um, and you're, you know, already going into menopause, um, it's, it might increase in size still, you know, and um, so that's the issue of not doing anything. Uh, but if you're having pressure, let's say you're not having any abnormal bleeding, but frequent urination, um, you know, pelvic pressure. Remember, with menopause, those are not likely to go away. So any type of pressure-related symptoms um, are, are going to stay. So it's really that, you know, once you stop having periods, maybe the heavy bleeding is no longer an issue, but the pressure is still there. Um, so that, that would be the reason to do a hysterectomy. Now, hysterectomy, remember, doesn't have to be done open. You know, microscopically, um, and you know, we, we do uh, hysterectomy is much bigger in size than you know, 10 centimeters, so it, it wouldn't be a, an invasive procedure, um, it would be minimally invasive, so small incisions, typically just two tiny incisions, um, and it's an outpatient procedure done at an outpatient surgical center rather than a hospital. So, those are all you know, positive things, um, and something to consider, um, if you're sort of not sure, should I do this, should I not do it, um, because. You know, it's a one day surgery, one week recovery, and then you can put your kind of fibroids behind you and not have to do an ultrasound over and over again. Then mm -hmm. let's say you go into menopause, you're postmenopausal, and then you have bleeding. And then you're like, is it the fibroid? Is it something else going on? So it's, it's you know, it's constantly something that you would have to follow up um, even in, in the menopausal period. So it, it's, it may sort of haunt you further beyond beyond menopause um so that's you know that that's my opinion absolutely thank you dr d mm -hmm. so um you mentioned something earlier about the delay in care and its impact on fertility when it comes to fibroids and that's actually our next myth so the myth is fibroids don't affect fertility talk to us about that dr d yeah um so actually there's a one uh, question here from the audience from Anisha um, Panchma Panchmaria. I found out I have three fibroids, 10, 10 centimeter, and then two, two and six centimeters or two by six um, when I was pregnant. Um, should I consider treating these fibroids if they're not causing me problems? So again, those are pretty sizable fibroids. So maybe the two centimeters is pretty small, but the, the 10 and the six, right? 
Um, so is, uh, yes, <laughs> the short answer would be yes. The mm -hmm. long answer, especially if you're you know, thinking about getting pregnant again, um, and I don't know whether there was any impact of those fibroids in the pregnancy, uh, but common, you know, issues from kind of least to greatest would be, you know, pain uh, during pregnancy, um, uh, contractions, you know, preterm contractions, but potentially earlier delivery. Um, and then, you know, the more serious consequences can be pregnancy loss. And that doesn't have to be, um, you know, first trimester miscarriages. Sometimes, you know, it's hard for us to say, was it really the fibroids or was there something else? Because those are just more common anyways. But mm -hmm. with large fibroids and let's say a second trimester pregnancy loss, when, you know, you've already told your family, your friends that you're pregnant, maybe you already know the sex of the baby. You know, it's, it's very devastating um, to have a loss at that time. And, you know, when you have large fibroids there, that, that certainly can be, uh, you know, the cause. Um, so uh, for women that know they have large fibroids prior to pregnancy, I typically recommend having them removed. Um, and uh, because it's, again, either can impact fertility or it can impact uh, Risha's ability to get pregnant or impact the pregnancy itself. Um, but then I, a lot of times I do my mechanisms on somebody who comes to me after they've been pregnant because there were you know, issues with pregnancies or because they don't want uh, an issue to occur with the next pregnancy. So uh, I would say those are definitely sizable fibroids that would need to be addressed. And there's also that that um, element of it impacting um, fertility treatments when doing IVF. Right, right, yeah. So, you know, IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, um, you know, is a treatment for, for women who are not able to conceive spontaneously and um you know it's quite expensive um it's you know time consuming um you know it's very stressful physically and emotionally um and certainly um before going through that you want to you know optimize your chances right you want to make sure that mm -hmm. everything else is sort of as perfect as it can be um so that ivf works and sometimes it doesn't work and we don't know why right with everything being perfect but at least if you know that there's large fibroids why not have them removed before going through fertility treatments um and sometimes fertility doctors will recommend that um and and sometimes they don't i mean we've certainly seen uh patients come to us after they failed multiple ivf cycles um coming to us and saying you know i have these fibroids I wasn't told that I need to remove them, but I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should because nothing else is working. Um, and sometimes they're, they're very sizable and they're actually in the location where they, they should be impacting fertility. Could that be the only cause of their failed IVF? No. I mean, no, no one again knows, right, what the issue really is. But again, you, you really want to optimize your chances. And if you if you're going to take out you know, small polyps and any other things from the uterine cavity before going through fertility treatments, why not take out a large, you know, fibroid in the muscle of the uterus that's pushing onto this cavity um, and causing some distortion. So I really think that, and, you know, the biggest kind of concern that uh, fertility doctors have is that, you know, I, I send this patient for fibroid removal they have the surgery and they have complications and then, you know, the uterus is completely, you know, not, uh, you know, the scarring or whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that certainly, you know, is a risk with any surgery, right? You can develop infection or, or any complications, but, and that, that is a reason to go to a specialist. So in the hands of a specialist, um, the risk of complication, the risk of scarring to the uterus and all these things are much lower. Um, and, and that's another reason not to wait, right? So if, if you don't delay care and if you don't have these enormous multiple fibroids, your chances of us being able to remove those fibroids, reconstruct the uterus and the uterus still be functional is very good. Um, you know, a lot of times patients ask me, you know, what are, um, or what, what's your uh, success rate? Or mm -hmm. you know, how often do patients get pregnant? And, you know, it, it really varies. I think, you know, age is one, of course. Um, you know, if you're in your 40s, um, 
you know, you could have a perfect uterus but never get pregnant because of an ovarian issue, right? So there's a lot, a lot of factors. But another factor is, you know, how many fibroids there are, how, how big they are. And that's directly related to, I think, you know, delay in care and really waiting um, instead of getting these addressed sooner. So I think if you have a diagnosis of fibroids, even if you think they're small and you're really not planning on doing anything about it at this moment, I think you should consult with a specialist um, so, so that you can get uh, the right opinion. That makes sense. Um, we have two audience comments or questions. One is from uh, Mila. Uh, she says, can you have an abnormal bleeding? Can you have abnormal ble bleeding once a year as a result of fibroids? Or fi should fibroids cause a more consistent bleeding? Typically, it's more consistent abnormal bleeding. Once a year, um, you know, that sounds a little bit unusual. But um, I, I think, you know, if you're not sure whether you have a fibroid, you certainly, you know, get an ultrasound and, and sort of figure it figure that out right there. And if, if you already know you have a fibroid, um, you know, depending on the size of it, um, you know, maybe removal makes sense, even if you're not sure whether it's causing the bleeding or not. Also location, you know, so, so there's different factors, but general, um, you know, typically the bleeding, abnormal bleeding is a little bit more consistent than once a year. And, and then Ava, Eva or Ava, says, I have a 14 centimeter fibroid and was told that I need to do a partial hysterectomy. But now I was told that I can do a wait and see, so a watch and wait approach. Um, I'm in my late 40s and was put on birth control while I wait. It's, it was more of a comment, like that's that's her situation right now. 14 centimeter fibro fibroid yeah. and she was told. Um, yeah, I mean, it. 14 centimeters, so it's a very large fibroid, right? So it's bigger than, you know, the 10. So it's it's this big now. Um, I mean, partial hysterectomy, typically, so if, if you're, the way we go by, you know, what's the treatment? Partial hysterectomy, or do we do a, my, a myomectomy, which is the um, fibroid removal only? And, you know, both of these can be done minimally invasively, but so which one do we go with? So partial hysterectomy is someone who, who, for whom um, fertility is not an issue, you know, who doesn't desire fertility. So it's not so much based on age, right? You can be 39 years old um, and you've already had kids and you, you don't want to have any more kids, or maybe you never want to have kids, whatever the issue is. So we're not really trying to preserve the uterus because the uterus is only for childbearing, right? Um, so we can do a partial hysterectomy. We can leave the ovaries for hormone production, um, and that really avoids having to have more fibroids in the future. So for a 14 centimeter fibroid, someone who's not interested in fertility, a partial hysterectomy does make sense. Um, I'm, I don't see the reason for watching and waiting um, because I can tell you that typically it's just gonna get bigger. Um, so if you wait, let's say five years, you know, maybe it'll be 20 centimeters. Um, and then you have the surgery then. So it, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to wait because you're just waiting to have the surgery at a later time. Um, meanwhile, dealing with any type of, you know, bulk symptoms, the symptoms that come from the uterus being uh, that enlarged. Birth control pills, um, you know, that's just managing the bleeding, which, which is what I'm assuming um, the pills are for. Um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, they don't do anything for fibroid in terms of treating the actual fibroid. Um, that's, you know, because it's a solid tumor, it's only treated surgically. You really just, you have to take it out. Um, you know, some women sometimes look into embolization, which is cutting off the blood flow to the fibroid. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, fibroids are dependent on blood flow and the hormones. So if you're not, you know, stopping the hormone production, you could, you know, theoretically cut off the blood flow to the fibroid to keep it from getting larger. The issue is that when it's already so large, um, remember, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so the embolization is good for smaller fibroids to keep them from getting to 14 centimeters. But if it's already 14 centimeters, you're not, you know, you're not likely to get any improvement in, the, again, the bulk symptoms, the symptoms that come from the uterus being already that size. Um, so the bleeding may improve. 
um, depending again on, on the wow. uterine locate on the fiber location within the uterus, but you're not going to feel like the uterus shrunk and now everything is great. So I think partial hysterectomy again makes sense um, and also can be done minimally invasively with you know two small incisions outpatient at an outpatient facility out of the hospital. Um, so I think for a lot of women, the hesitation to have surgery is because they think that it can only be done open. Hmm. Even if they have large fibroids, which we'll get into later. Um, Roops also is asking, does the pill make fibroids grow? I'm assuming it's the opposite, right? Well, it doesn't, no, it, it's not so much the opposite. So it, and, and nowadays, you know, all the pills are low estrogen pills. So certainly if you're on a high estrogen pill, you're potentially thinking that you're taking this extra estrogen and you could be stimulating the growth of the fibroids. With the really low estrogen pills, you're not likely to be doing any of that stuff, but you're not doing anything. You're just taking birth control pills to potentially lighten the, 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 um, the periods. Mm. The birth control pills thin out the uterine lining, so which is what sheds every month. So if you have less of it, you have less bleeding. Um, but with fibroids, because the way fibroids cause abnormal bleeding is not just, it's not like they're creating a thicker lining. Um, they're just in the, in the lining. So if, the pill may not control the bleeding that the fibroids are causing at all. Um, it all may be temporary. Um, so birth control pill is just not, it's not a treatment for fibroids. It's, it's treating the, the bleeding, not the fibroids. Got it. Um, and I just wanted to add, since we were still on the topic of fertility, that um, COVID has, COVID-19 has delayed fertility journeys for many women. Um, the CDC actually recently issued guidelines on the impact of contracting COVID-19 while pregnant. And their preliminary research found that pregnant women are at an increased risk of severe illness and preterm birth. But just because you might be delaying pregnancy right now doesn't mean you need to completely halt your fertility journey. Now is the time to prepare your body for a successful conception and pregnancy by moving forward with fibroid removal, kind of like what Dr. D was saying earlier. You want to restore your uterine cavity back to normal so you can have a successful fertility journey. Um, you could kind of view it as this preparation phase. And a GYN specialist can help you do that, ensuring nothing stands in the way of the family of your dreams. Um, so if you want to learn more about how a GYN specialist could help you in your fertility journey, you can go to our blog at innovativegyn.com forward slash key to fertility. And our next myth, Dr. D, you kind of touched on already. Um, it's embolization or ablation are the best fibroid treatments if you want to retain fertility. Now, if you go online, you see a lot of articles stating that embolization or ablation don't impact fertility. And you were saying earlier how embolization is where you cut off the blood supply to the fibroids. How can that impact fertility? Right, because so you're cutting off the blood flow in the uterus that's going to the fibroids. So you're, you're, you're blocking some of the uterine blood supply. Um, and you know, the, these typically are, these are the fibroids that are in the uterine muscle. So you're essentially, um, blocking some of the blood flow to the uterine muscle, um, targeting where, where the fibroids are located. So it absolutely does impact fertility. Um, that's not, I mean, I can tell you, very recently, I had a patient who had a large fibroid and was told that either she does embolization or she has to have an open myomectomy. And she was in her early 20s. Um, she was living in England at the time. And, you know, because she didn't want to have open surgery and wasn't really given any other option, she went with embolization. Um, she then, you know, moved to the U.S. and went to... I think it was maybe general OBGYN or even a fertility doctor. And they told her like there, she has no chance of getting pregnant now. Um, and, you know, she came to me to have the fibroid removed. Um, and we talked about that, you know, whatever sort of damage the embolization has done, that's would not be reversed with the myomectomy. Mm -hmm. You could probably just remove the fibroid because it was large. 
um, but that that would be it really. And you know, when I did her surgery, there was nothing left of the uterus. The the whole because the blood supply to the uterine muscle was so much affected because it was a large fibroid. So they really, you know, to target the entire fibroid blood supply, they really had to target a lot of the blood vessels. Um, there, the muscle was so atrophied, the uterine muscle, which is the body of the uterus. There was like, mm -hmm. it was just a thin film of it. And the rest was just a fibroid and that's it. There was nothing else left. Um, so that's not, I mean, that should have never been done. She should have had a myomectomy. Um, and you know, if, if the open myomectomy was the only option at the time that should have been given to her as the only option not the embolization, but she was presented as if they were equally good and that they would not impact her fertility. Um, so, and sorry. that's how it's presented online too. So it's so important to get the get the word out that no, in fact, it it does have a huge impact on fertility. Yeah, because you're impacting the blood flow, the uterine blood flow, right? Um, and then the fibroid is still there. I mean, what what's happening to the fibroid? So if you have a large fibroid that's taking out the majority of the uterus. And let's say you kill it with this, you know, blocking the blood flow, the fiber is still there. So it's, it's not even allowed, even if there was great blood supply to the uterus after the embolization, you're still not allowing the pregnancy to happen because the fiber is there. So you, right. you've done absolutely nothing. It's different if, if pregnancy is not a consideration, uh, but it absolutely should not be done. Uh, if, if pregnancy is a consideration. And then the ablation, I don't think there's anything out there saying you can get pregnant after ablation because the ablation is, um, it's not embolization. Ablation is burning the uterine lining um, for abnormal bleeding. So in the ablation, the lining of the uterus, which is what the embryo uh, attaches to when the pregnancy happens, the lining is burnt permanently. Um, okay. So that's not... Uh, at all. I mean, it would, yeah, it, it would be completely incompatible with pregnancy. Um, what about, Dr. D, um, what about the, the Sonata treatments or the Assessa where they do the radio frequency? Um, right. Yeah. So the radio frequency, right? So you're, you're targeting the fibroid um, and you're causing degeneration. So sort of the same idea as cutting off its blood supply, except for you're not doing that. You're not cutting off the blood supply, but you're trying to kill the fibroid. Um, so, you know, the issue there, again, if it's a large fibroid, um, it's and it's impacting fertility from where it is and how big it is, um, it's still going to be there. And I've seen patients after SESA not having really great decrease in size with this fibroid. Um, so, you know, it might be degenerated, right? So some of it may, it may not get bigger, but if it's still, you know, 10 centimeters, um, right in the uterine muscle and impacting the uterine cavity, it's still going to be an issue with pregnancy. So you have to, you know, the issue with online is that there's a lot of accurate information and there's a lot of inaccurate, and sometimes it's hard to know, you know, what to read. So you have to sort of go with more evidence-based and talk to multiple specialists um, and, and really ask, you know, the, the right questions because <laughs> just so my dogs, but um, because it's not, you know, just because it's a treatment works for one person doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Um, and that, that, that's very important. Even with family members, you know, one family member could say, oh, I had this done. It was great. Or I had this done. It was terrible. Um, you have to understand that every person's situation is different even though it seems uh even if it seems uh same on sur on the surface it may be completely different um and the outcome that you have may be different from what you know your your mom or your sister had so um, you to talk to the specialist that's a great point um uh, mila is asking can fibroids that were ablated regrow so I'm assuming like embolized or maybe assessed. Yes. So those typically, I mean, sometimes, you know, if it's a fibroid is massive, right. And has so much blood flow. If you're embolized those, that fibroid, if you do uh, assess a, um, it, you just might not get all of it. Right. And it might still continue to grow. It's not that it's regrowing. It's just wasn't killed completely. But mm -hmm. if let's say the procedure worked, um, that fibroid would just sit there but you could have fibroids grow anywhere else within the uterus. So 
Um, so, yeah. Okay. And she's also asking um, how safe or effective is, I don't know how to pronounce that, Dr. D, or it's the medication, the oral medication that lightens heavy menstrual periods for fibroids. Ori, ori. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, so we, we talked about fibroids being estrogen dependent and then it's being blood supply, right? So now we're switching from blocking the blood flow to the fibroid um, to hormonally affecting it. Um, so with, with hormones, so if you, let's say you put somebody on the medication that um, stops the estrogen production, you could impact the fibroid. Traditionally it was Lupron, right? So people were put on Lupron, which is an injection um, that puts you into menopause and then your, you know, your bleeding stopped and, you know, that sort of uh, provided a short-term solution for the fibroids and the heavy bleeding. The problem is that you can't be on that medication forever. Um, I mean, or at least you shouldn't. So you, you're not really solving the issue, right? So you're just right. temporarily stopping the estrogen production, your periods stop, um, you know, you have some maybe menopause, so symptoms, and then the fibroids don't grow at that time. And maybe they even, you know, start to degenerate depending on how long you can stand being on that medication. But once you stop the medicine, just like with endometriosis, you can have new fibroids um, that grow. And then the existing fibroids may still be an issue if they're large enough. So it, it, that's why, you know, anything that sort of doesn't address the tumor itself, but just addressing, um, you know, the blood, the blood supply or the, the hormone issue, it's not for everyone. Um, I think if the fibroids are very small, you know, you could try it and see if you can stop its growth, you know, permanently. Um, if, if the size that there are at now is not already a problem. Got it. Okay. Jolene is asking, where should you begin if you have multiple fibroids and adenomyosis to receive treatment for both? Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's tough and that's very, very common. Um, a lot of, uh, women have undiagnosed adenomyosis, you know, they have known fibroids, but, um, the adenomyosis piece of it is, is missed for years. And so, um, when, you know, when they present for treatment, um, a lot of times we talk about, let's say taking out fibroids, but then sometimes the symptoms kind of clue you in that maybe it's not all just fibroids, maybe there's adenomyosis. So that's where the MRI comes in. They can pick up, um, the presence for adenomyosis. So if, it's not ideal to have a myomectomy if there's adenomyosis especially mm -hmm. if there's extensive adenomyosis and not so extensive fibroids, because you're just, it, it's going to be a surgery that's not going to be of any benefit. The likely, you know, if you have extensive adenomyosis, the likely cause of pain and the bleeding is the adenomyosis, not the fibroids. So removing them is not going to really improve anything. Sometimes, you know, we, we um, in patients who have large fibroids who are trying to you know, who are desiring fertility. Uh, but, you know, there's definitely a lot of counseling involved um, that they have to understand that the, their chances of getting pregnant, even after removing all these fibroids, it, is low. Their, their chance is low because of the adenomyosis. Um, hmm. So if, you know, so understanding that if somebody just, you know, wants the pain to stop, wants the bleeding to stop, the best, really the only treatment should be a uh, partial hysterectomy. So if you remove the uterus, you're removing the adenomyosis and the fibroids. Otherwise, you're just taking out the fibroids and leaving the adenomyosis still behind. Okay, great. And we have two more audience questions before we close out. So again, from Ava, we have, does weight contribute to the fibroid in any way? I'm assuming body weight about a bit like estrogen production. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, some kind of thought to that and not to say that thin women can't have fibroids. I mean, definitely, um, that happens a lot, but, um, you know, can, is that extra, extra estrogen production. So in terms of estrogen, um, main production, right. Is from ovaries. Um, however, the, you know, overweight women, obese women have more estrogen production not from their ovaries, but from the conversion of the androgens or like testosterone. Um, and that conversion happens 
in the fat cells and they're converted into estrogens. Um, so can that estrogen, that extra, you know, estrogen uh, play a role in fibroid growth, um, fibroid development? I mean, that's definitely a possibility. I think we, we don't know 100%, but, you know, when we counsel women of, um, you know, after surgery, it's very common. Women want to know what, you know, what do I do? What can I do to prevent fibroids from coming back? And certainly, um, you know, if you're at risk for fibroids and if you've had fibroids before, that's already your risk factor that they're going to come back. Multiple fibroids are a risk factor for recurrence. Um, but perhaps, you know, if you, you're able to lower the weight um, and decrease some estrogen production, maybe, you know, maybe that could um, slow things down. But you know, we really don't know. Okay. And uh, Notali is asking, can, is it possible to do fibroid removal and liposuction in the same procedure? Removal and liposuction. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on um, where you, so liposuction, it's pretty like, I mean, those are usually done not, um, they don't need to be done necessarily under, you know, general anesthesia. I think th those can be done under IV sedation, I believe. Um, so it's, you're not, there's not a whole lot of advantage of doing that at the same time. Also, um, typically, you know, with plastic surgery, um, you don't want to pair it with GYN surgery. So GYN surgery um, is usually considered to be sort of, um, you know, not as sterile as some of the other procedures because you're dealing with, um, you know, vaginal area. Um, and even though you're doing, when you're taking out fibroids, you're going through an abdominal, small abdominal incision, you're still, there's, you know, things kind of there that you're potentially introducing. So just your risk of infection um, is, is going to increase. Um, and, and some procedures, you know, that, that risk is just not acceptable. So for example, you would never do an orthopedic procedure with a GYN procedure because orthopedic mm -hmm. procedure can be has to be like super duper duper you know sterile. You cannot introduce any of that you know bad bacteria um, in, into the into the joint or whatever you're dealing with. Um, you know, same thing with with plastic surgery. I think most plastic surgeons would prefer not to combine um, those type of procedures. And again, there's no advantage. I mean, it's not like you're would be using the same incisions um, or not like you would have to be intubated for, for the liposuction. So I, um, and certainly, you know, typically you, you would want the liposuction to be done by a plastic surgeon and the um, fibroid removal or hysterectomy or whatever, the GYN surgery by a GYN surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, even, even though I've heard of GYN um, surgeons doing cosmetic procedures, I'm not, really a fan of that idea really um because you just you have to stick of to what you know you know you don't want to um <laughs> sometimes patients ask me like can you take out some fat well i'm like trust me you don't want me doing plastic surgery <laughs> i have no idea what, what i'm doing so i think it's it's best to go to a specialist and let them do what they know best and don't try to kind of um maybe cover too many you know bases so I, yeah I don't think so. I think you just do lipo at a separate time, hysterectomy or myomectomy at a separate time. Got it. Brenda is asking, um, she's saying, I had a myomectomy a year ago, and then a year later, I'm experiencing heavy periods again, lasting two weeks. It shows I have fibroids again. My gynecologist is giving me the option of removing my uterus. I'm 42 years old, and I don't want to remove my uterus but I feel that this is my last option right now. Is another myomectomy an option again, or should I remove my uterus? So you can do another myomectomy, um, but I can tell you why it's kind of less preferable. Um, well, first, it, it, it's going to depend on really how many fibroids are there. If we're talking about like you have, you know, one or two fibroids, yeah, I guess you could go in and, and take those out and still preserve the uterus, understanding that, you know, you could have more fibroids come back again in five years, and now you're back kind of to square one. So that, that's the downside of doing another myomectomy. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to consider the risks, right? You know, how extensive does the second myomectomy have to be? 
how much scar tissue is there from the first myomectomy? How much scar tissue is there going to be if there's going to be a third myomectomy? Right. So those are all the things to consider. So partial hysterectomy, um, it it does make more sense from the medical standpoint. Um, it's less risks, um, you know, shorter recovery, um, and 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 you eliminate your chance of fibroids coming back at a later time. I mean, certainly women can feel, um, you know, that a hysterectomy can impact them emotionally. Um, you know, the loss of the uterus, the loss of of childbearing, um, things like that. So, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely had patients um, that, that have that. So, but you have to un sort of understand your, the risks with doing another myomectomy and, uh, and think about whether it's, it's worth it. Absolutely. Roxana is asking if you have multiple fibroids, some large and endometriosis, what's your best bet to keep to maintain fertility? Well, to take them out, that would be the, the best thing. Um, you know, whether they're large and small, but in, I mean, especially if they're large, if, especially if there's endometriosis, if you leave things the way they are, endometriosis and fibroids, that's certainly not good for fertility. Um, so taking out the, the fibroids and taking out endometriosis, um, you know, is, is going to be helpful, and, but also pursuing fertility sooner than later. Um, because if you, let's say, do a you know fibroid surgery and endometriosis, but then decide, well, I'm not really going to get pregnant right now, and then not, nothing happens for five years, you know, all those things come back. Um, and then the age, you know, becomes an issue if it's not already an issue. So, all, you know, fertility, it, it's a complex thing. I mean, so many things depend on fertility. Um, and, you know, sometimes if you think about it, you're like, how do people even get pregnant accidentally since it's like so complicated, but really it's, I think it's much easier to not be able to get pregnant than to be able to get pregnant because so many things have to, has to have to function, uh, properly. So, uh, but, so if it's something that's definitely your goal in life, you can't take it lightly. Um, and you can't just keep pushing it off, pushing it off, thinking that it, it'll happen because for many, many people, it doesn't happen because of, you know, delay. Right. And if you think about it, just in terms of fertility and your, your uterine cavity, just put it in simple terms, right? If you, if you, you want a clear pathway, right? But if you have all this stuff that's in the way, fibroids and all this scar tissue from endometriosis, it's hard to get that fertilized egg to get implanted and, you know, to, to become pregnant. So it makes sense to remove it and the endometriosis as well. Mm -hmm. um, Mila is asking, is eight millimeters thickness considered adenomyosis? I'm assuming she's talking about the junctional. Uterine. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's not the uterine line, it's the junctional zone. Um, if you're talking about an MRI. Yeah. So it, it, it's not adenomyosis. Um, so, but, but, you know, it can, can an MRI miss adenomyosis? It can. So it's not, um, you know, a hundred percent. Um, you can have, if there's a lot of symptoms and everything's sort of pointing towards aden adenomyosis, it's possible that there's some focal adenomyosis and that it just, it's not, you know, showing up, um, on the MRI. So you have to, you know, all, all the imaging studies, you just have to, you know, take it kind of with a grain of salt and kind of look at the biggest, bigger picture and see like, what is the issue? And, um, what am I willing to do to to address it? Mm. Okay, let's move on to Terry. She's asking if the doctor says a subserosal fibroid should not affect a woman getting pregnant, but it has been over a year of me trying, could that be the cause? How big is this fibroid, I guess, would be the, yeah. Typically, if it's a small subserosal fibroid, probably not. Now, if it's been a year trying, um, so that in itself would be a reason to go see a, a fertility specialist, right? Because there, there could be other things going on. This fibroid may or may not be the issue, but there you know, could be other, other things. So it's certainly, you know, if somebody came to me, let's say with a five centimeter subserosal fibroid, um, I wouldn't, I couldn't say, you know, that yes, it's definitely the fibroid or it's definitely not the fibroid. Maybe the fibroid may still need to be removed, but I would definitely want to find out what else is going on. Um, you know, is this fibroid causing 
blockage of the fallopian tube and maybe the other fallopian tube is also not functional and so here you go you got no tubes no pregnancy so there you know it's um like i said fertility is so complicated you really have to you, you, if it's been a year and you've been trying whether there's anything been found on imaging or not that warrants an evaluation by a fertility doctor hmm. Well, Dr. G, this turned out to be a very popular topic. So we're going to stop at this point because we're at our hour mark. And um, we'll put our remaining myths into a part two session. So stay tuned for part two. And let us know if you have any more myths you would like us to cover in the next slide. We'll be sure to include those. Thank you again, Dr. D, for joining us. Do you have any last comments you want to share with our viewers? Yeah, that's it. I mean, just you know, the main thing: go see a specialist. You know, if it's if it's a fertility issue, you got to see a fertility specialist. Yes, you know, general OBGYNs have general knowledge, but really, um, you know, when it comes to workup and 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 you know the latest kind of recommendations, um, you have to go to the specialist because they're they're always going to be more up to date. When it comes to surgical issues like fibroids, you know, endometriosis, things like that, again, a specialist. Um, I think, you know, it, it, you have to involve the specialist, um, in, in the management because you don't want to delay things and impact something permanently like, like fertility. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. D. And we had two special guests throughout this live, but you did not introduce them to us. So Whoa. yeah, hold on here. <laughs> let me get one. Very important. <laughs> The other one went, went somewhere. Wow. Just to try to go outside. This is Mila. Oh, Angel. <laughs> very cute. She's been very polite. Yeah, she's a boxer. And she is, she's going to be one years old in two days. Oh, look, and there's moose. And this one, let's see. I think it, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> That's so heavy. Oh, my God. Here we go. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, Moose. Here we go. This, How old is Moose? Moose. this is Moose. He is three years old. Oh, what a sweetheart. They're so well behaved. We well, didn't even know they were there. They kept like peeking in and out. So I was like, you have to introduce. Yeah. Well, yeah, but Mila keeps taking this stuffed animal and she's like chewing it. So <laughs> I kept so having that was a it. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, they're cute. They're from Adopt a Boxer Rescue. And. They're very sweet. So someone, very sweet. someone didn't want them anymore. But we and now them. you're giving them all the love they need. Yeah. Hopefully they'll join us in upcoming lives as well. Yes. <laughs> so um, for our viewers, um, our amazing behind the scenes scenes team put together this guide for you guys on questions to ask your doctor about fibroids. Just as a thank you for participating. Um, and you can download that at innovativegyn.com forward slash fibroid FAQ. And as always, we'll have a recap of this event published on our blog next week. Both a written article and a recording will be available at innovativegyn.com forward slash fibroid mythbusters. Thanks again for joining everyone. Thank you, Dr. D. Thanks. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.